from Agent C. There's a lady in the car next to me being shot. Is she alive? I don't know. Okay. That's everywhere. Okay. Cheryl, who's her name? Hang on. Cheryl. Yeah. Cheryl. Revive me. Cheryl, can you hear me? Where? Andy, they're going to need to get her out, mate. Which house in Andy? This one here. Right, okay. Soaks. They're correct, they're doing CPR at the moment, Anna. So let the ambulance crew do what they need to do. You, Where you, is that your mum? Yeah. Right, we don't know yet. We'll let the ambulance crew do what they need to do, all right? Job, they're going to be doing. Way, do you, what did you see what happened? Did I you see anything? Yeah. Come and sit come and sit down. What's your name? Come and sit yeah. down. What's your name? Georgia. 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 Is it Georgia, is it? George, sit down, come. On. What did um, you see? Um <sighs> She was screaming and shouting, Jack, 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 and she couldn't get out of the car. I thought he had a spade or a sledgehammer. I didn't see it was a gun until I got around the car and he went like that. Movement. Movement. Lights on. Somebody there. Contact. The oh, police! Keep your hands in the air! Move out to the open! Time to get on the floor, mate. Get down on the floor! Cover the buildings left and right. Cover the buildings. Get down on the floor. Andrew, get on the floor. Good evening. A man has been arrested on suspicion of murder after a woman was found in a car in Shropshire having been shot in the neck. Paramedics tried to save the woman but declared her dead at the scene. Detectives believe that the man and woman were known to each other. If you could just state your name for me. Just which one? That sounds a bit weird. Oh, okay. Which one? Your first name. Uh, Georgia. Georgia, and do you have any middle names, Georgia? Uh, yeah, May. Okay, you're 14 at the moment. Yeah. And what we're talking about here today, are you um, okay to talk to us right now, Anthea? Okay, well, I'll do that. Absolutely, and we, we discussed that outside, didn't we? You, you know, you've been quite adamant with us that you want to speak to us right now and just get oh, over and over done now. And that's perfect. So if at any point that it does get a little bit too much for you, okay, just let me know. I know that it's going to be very, very difficult for you to talk about it's what's got, got to be done. done. It's got to be done. I was in complete shock. All I could see on repeat was him shooting mum over and over and over and over and over again. The police gave me the option to either do an interview that night or in the morning. And I chose to go and do it that night while everything was in my head and I knew exactly what was what. She's a 14-year-old girl. That's a really delicate thing to be doing. But we need fast time information for her to sit down and give us that account so quickly after the murder of her mother. It's just phenomenal. I have a very firm belief that there's a reason I wasn't hurt and there's a reason I'm here to be sharing our story, to be trying to save other people's lives. My mum was incredibly generous, always trying to do the best for everyone at all times and 
She was incredibly loyal with people. <laughs> for better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. Her first marriage for my dad didn't work out. Mum was 37 when she had me. I was her only child. She's been a good girl today. She has. Which means she'll probably be a naughty girl tonight. You're going to talk to Granddad? You're going to talk to Granddad. Good night. Good night. Cheryl, as a daughter and as a mother, was very caring. Do you love me? Yeah. Everything that Georgia required, Cheryl provided. Mm -hmm. Even as a single mum, she worked her backside off. Go, Georgia! Woo! Good girl! We were like the A-team, you know, pretty much inseparable. Hello. When my mum met Jack, Certainly, we were looking for stability, but also I think Mum just wanted to be loved, to be honest. A 45-year-old man is still under police guard after being arrested on suspicion of murder. The body of a woman in her 50s was found in a car in Newport, Shropshire. And when did you first hear from your mum that something wasn't right? It was just a text message to say Jack had shown up. Yeah. He's a big guy. He's, I think he's just under six, but he could pick me up with one arm. He's strong. He's a big guy. The first time I was aware of Jack, I remember him picking me up from school, and she said, you know, oh, I'm going to go and take you to meet someone. She said he had a farm. <laughs> I remember Jack being really chatty and, you know, enjoying the fact that we were there, wanting to show me around, wanting to show Mum around. He had that sort of dad look about him, so I was really excited for him to possibly take that role. I fell in love with the farm immediately. That was, like, my, my dream place to be. Morning, girl. She'll let you stroke her, which is really nice. I remember Sean turning up at the farm and thinking, The next day, I said to Jack, I said, who's that? That's my girlfriend, my partner. You could see in Jack's eyes, he knew he was batting above his mark. I think both my mum and I were excited to see where this relationship would go. He put in the, the work and the effort and the graft to win her over and, you know, and to show Mum, you know, that he really cared. I will you. The first time we met Jack was at church. Cheryl was a committed Christian. She wanted him to be there and, and he came. He just looked so happy and... and Re really happy to be there and to be with Cheryl. He came from birthday parties, music concert, having fun and being silly with, with the kids. He just seemed like a nice guy, the sort of person that she was looking for. Cheryl was very impressed. She found this man that was going to give her a Everything. comfortable life that she hadn't got to keep working her backside off. He had his own business, he had nice cars, he had an eight-bedroom farmhouse. You know, he did put in the effort, you know, to wine and dine. He bought mum presents. He was so charming. But I don't think anybody knew the real Jack. You're saying that you keep seeing things that keeps replaying in your mind, OK? And you've also mentioned briefly about smells before. I, I, I know there's a smell of a shotgun cartridge mm -hmm. and it, it just... I know it's going to be really, really difficult for you, but we, at this stage we need to kind of access those memories just to get as much detail as we possibly can from you. And so just go back to the... Sorry, have you ever seen that gun before? 
I, I don't, I don't know. I've, he's got loads, he's got lots of guns. Jack loved shooting. He used to arrange shoots. Cheryl and Georgia absolutely loved being part of that. Jack seemed really, really proud uh, that she was portraying him in a very good light because she was such a good host. He wanted to be Lord of the Manor. He got like a bucket list sort of thing that he needed to have to be Lord Jack. Top of the list would have been beautiful wife. Tick. They went away for a weekend to Paris. They were at the Eiffel Tower. And that's when he decided to propose. <laughs> Mum was definitely happy when they got engaged. It was, you know, what she'd wanted. I was hoping that we would really become a family. She loved him. She thought that the whole world was going to be... Change. Change for the better. But it didn't turn out like that. No, didn't turn out at all like that. Detectives are waiting to question a man in connection with the shooting death of a woman in Newport. Cheryl Hooper was shot in her car in front of their teenage daughter outside a house on Farmer's Gate. And what was their relationship like? Strange. In what way was it strange? He was never in. We never saw him. And it was like we led separate lives. We were never a family, really, to be fair. Oh, it's only me. Um, I probably won't go to bonfire night if you want to take Georgia and don't bother waiting for me. Okay, doke. The one thing that she didn't expect was to be a lonely housewife every night, which she admitted to me she was. He said that he'd been mistreating her in what way? Just not caring, he'd never be there. He never did any of the housework at all. He always said that was mom's job. Mum was expected to do all the washing, all the cooking, all the cleaning, an eight-bedroom house. Mum worked five days a week, long hours. It completely tired her out. But she was just so desperate for some love and attention from him. Cheryl tried really hard to make the relationship work and she did everything that he wanted her to do and her wages were swallowed up. She hardly had any money left for herself. He wanted to keep her poor, make him believe he got money in the hand yeah. and he was deep in debt. ever did was go out. He used to leave her and go out and get drunk and um, spend the money. Wait. Where did it become the mum? Do it again. Jack would normally be at the pub, so oftentimes we wouldn't see him. However, when he was there, his presence was definitely felt. It was a game of the silent treatment and very quickly we learned what was right and what was wrong. But then we had to learn that the hard way. My mum would want to talk to him because he 
you know, they've been mistreated her. And you know how couples want to talk and sort things out, and he just used her to shut the fuck up and go to sleep. We know that Cheryl was in fear of making normal choices about what she wanted to do, because if she was to do something that Jack didn't agree with, there would be consequences. There's the three weeks of silence. There's the threat to remove financial backing. The way Jack treated Cheryl was controlling and coercive behaviour. And Cheryl was scared. One of the things that Cheryl really wanted was to see her friends. Cheryl's decided to go out with a friend. A rare occurrence for her. Jack really didn't like that. Jack never liked my mum going out. The whole seven years, sorry, they were together. Um, I don't think my mum ever really went out with her friends. He stopped her going out with her friends. That night was definitely the first time he would use the gun as some kind of power over her. He'd come back drunk from the pub. And I think he was quite accusational, thought she'd been cheating on him. I could hear shouting and, you know, just, you know, bawling. So I was like, I'd go to the door and listen just to make sure everything's OK. I heard a loud bang. He smashed the television all over the floor. And I could just hear fiddling around in the gun cabinet. He was breaking the gun and putting it back together, breaking it and putting it back together. And then he started walking up the stairs. My mum just thinking, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. waited long enough for her to think, I'm going to, I'm going to die. And then he left. Cheryl just said, you know, I, I can't live this way anymore and I've got to protect my daughter. So she left the farm. There was a team of us that went in to just get the essentials. There was a tinge of fear because Jack had said he would stay away, but I don't think she was sure he would. I spent the entire day that we moved out of the farm crying. <laughs> we were both aware that he could be violent and we also knew he was not going to let anything go very easily. Once we left, we were staying at when Anne and Grandad's. She played it there because of Georgia, but she was glad to be under the roof of a parent where she was safe. You're so vain, Mother. Not showing my... No. <laughs> I'm so vain. You're always looking at yourself. She said, I'm not going back there. I'm leaving him. And I said, good. Was Jack possessive of Cheryl? Definitely. It's, it's like a dog with a toy. In fact, dog loves that toy and you take it away from him. I mean, that's going to bite you. Yeah.
All he kept doing was finding Cholo. He was desperate, desperate for Cholo to come back. Mum had disappeared in the evening. I didn't know where she'd gone. I received a call from Cheryl. Said I'm with Jack. He was trying to kill himself. I think she sat with him for two hours trying to convince him to put the gun down. She felt very responsible. She was like, if he kills himself, it's going to be my fault. It's going to be because of me. He was sat like this on the sofa with it in between his legs under his chin. And I think she put her chin over the one bar a little just to try and stop him. And eventually he put the gun down. Yes, he was sad. But I think it was more that he would hope that Cheryl would feel guilty, sorry for him, you know, and come running back. Deep down, she knew she was never getting back. She just couldn't say that to him. She was worried about how he would react. But actually, Cheryl should have been worrying about herself and not him because she was the one that was in danger. He started going out more in the evenings, going out, coming back, and the times weren't pub times. You know, I, I came to the assumption that he was watching her. I kept hearing his engine go by. I was very much aware that he was out there keeping tabs on us. That was the start of the stalking, really. That was when things got serious. He came onto my granddad's property um, a few weeks ago, and he didn't even tell us, he just took her car. Unbeknownst to Cheryl, Jack had taken her car to fit a tracker to the vehicle. He apologised a few days later, saying, um, look, he had the car back. From that moment, Jack Hooper was able to then monitor where Cheryl was going every minute of the day. Yes, I wonder if you could help me. Right, OK. What was the incident that happened? Um, it, it started with my, my husband just smashing the TV and um, and then different things of threatening to kill himself. And uh, uh, then he, he took my car from my parents' house and I didn't know about it. He did sort of follow us around a little bit. Uh, over Christmas. We didn't see him, but he did ring up to say that he'd been looking for us. Right, OK. I suppose upset people and frustrated people just do silly things, don't they? Yeah. So. And what's your ex-partner's name? Andrew Jonathan Hooper. Do you know when that was taken off? There's been several incidents with the guns, so it happened a while, but um, last week or something. Last week, you think? Jack losing his guns would mean he couldn't go shooting, and shooting was a big show because he ran his own shoot. 
for all of his friends to see that he lost his guns because of something he was doing. That would be really embarrassing. He's lost Cheryl already, and then he's lost his guns. So what's he got left in life? But that night, Cheryl has made arrangements to go out with a friend. So you tell me about your mum and her friend. My mum's friend was Caroline Tranter. When I first met Cheryl, it was coming to an end with her and Jack. She said, I need you to come for a drink with me, I've got a friend. Really, with it being quite soon after a breakdown of a relationship, I was really excited for her to meet another man. It wasn't anything serious. I think they just lent on each other a little bit and tried to help each other through it. Yeah, through the hard times. We was going out of town and the car had followed us quite away. And I remember saying, Cheryl, this better not be Jack behind us. Just in kind of jest, but kind of thinking, oh, I hope it's not. She said, no, Jack won't know where we've gone. Cheryl was really happy, really happy. She said, have a Prosecco and let the Prosecco do the talking. And then we were joined by three men, Cheryl's friends, and we stood chatting. This strange man came in the pub. How has he found us? She got tapped on the shoulder and turned round and he was stood there and he went something along the lines of thought he'd be with him, looked at um the guy because obviously he was like he's quite controlling and he jealous I think she said let's take this outside Jack she was not scared that Jack had come in the pub I was petrified for her he said he was going to go and burn all that stuff and he said, I'm going to divorce you for being unfaithful. They was outside for about ten minutes. And then Jack left. left. When she came back in, she was calm. I asked her if she wanted to leave and she said, no, everything was fine. I think she became really good at hiding the signs of an abusive relationship. She texted me to say what happened. I called him just to, just to try and plead him not to burn my stuff and just to leave it. Yeah. Good to tell you, the room, Jack. She's giving you chance after chance. Yeah, I know it is, and it's your fault. Yes, it is. If you hadn't treated us badly, it, it wouldn't be over. Oh, that's what you think, that's what you think, Georgia. That's what I know. You're 14, you know shit. That's nice. <laughs> this has been going on for a long time. It doesn't mean you have a right to track the car. It doesn't mean you have a right to burn our stuff. Jack goes back home to the Gildermonks farm. Within minutes, he's taken something from the farmhouse to place into his vehicle. It's my opinion that he's carrying a gun. He then goes back in. 
and he's then monitoring the tracker via his computer. Cheryl phoned me up and said, Dad, Jack has followed me to the pub. I think he's put a tracker underneath my car. I said, Cheryl, go to the police now. She didn't take heed to that. I don't think she realised enough how she was in danger. And she said, I'll, I'll see you in the morning, Mum. I'll pick you up. And I love you. And that was the last words. I never saw her again. We left the pub. And I said to Chow, you need to get Georgia and you need to go home. My mum picked me up and she was on the phone to him when she picked me up. Um, yeah, she was having an argument with him on the phone. That's how she went. I'm guessing you know where I am then. And he went, yeah, yeah, I do. She just went, fuck you, and put the phone down. As Cheryl pulls up outside her home, simultaneously, Jack Hooper is also pulling up outside. I've never seen my mum so scared in my entire life. She just screamed, oh, my God, he's here. They're going to need to get her out, mate. Yeah, you've got one female in the vehicle. She's in a uh, Range Rover Evoque. He'll get knackered doing CPR as long as someone's there to help him with CPR. <coughs> right, okay. Folks, they're, correct. they're doing CPR at the moment on her, so let the ambulance crew do what they need to do. You, Where you, is that your mum? Yeah. Hold up on the drive. He pulled up in the silver. Land Rover behind the car, so my mum couldn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. He went up to the driver's window and had the gun and was banging the barrel against the glass. And I didn't want to go over it. I don't want to go over it. Oh, George, I know this is difficult. He was hitting the gun against the car. I thought it was just fade or something. I just okay. thought he was going to hit it or something. I jumped out of the car trying to unlock my phone. I couldn't unlock my phone, trying to get the police to come straight away. He banged the glass, the glass shattered, and then he put the gun up properly and shot them. Oh, I can't get out with it. Cheryl had suffered two catastrophic shotgun injuries, one to her right arm and one to the neck area. There's an urgent need now to locate and arrest Hooper. He's obviously a desperate man. He's just killed his wife in cold blood. He's armed and he's dangerous. Who knows what's going through his mind? Movement. Movement. Lights on. Mike, we've just had a... Um... Security light come on outside the property. Outside the property? Yeah, here. This light that's just come on now has literally just come on. Yeah. Yeah, come on. You happy for us to move forward? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moving. The firearm team have got to approach the farm down a really long lane. It's pitch black. They don't know where he is. He could be hidden anywhere. 
they know that the last thing that Mr. Hooper did was to kill his wife. And who knows what's going through his mind. <laughs> yeah, somebody there. Move on. Okay. Oh, police! Get your hands in the air! Move out to the open! Come get on the floor, mate. Get down on the floor! <laughs> Cover the buildings left and right. Cover the buildings. He shot himself. Yeah. Get down on the floor. Andrew, get on the floor. Get on the floor now. Andrew, get on the floor. Floor now. Someone get a med pack. I've got a med pack. Okay. His face is. It's devastated, if I'm honest. He's clearly taking the gun to his face. And the moment that they come across him, they go from seeking his arrest to having to provide critical first aid. Get on your knees for me. Get on your knees, buddy. Kneel down. Kneel down. Andrew, kneel down for me. We're here to help. Kneel down. Good lad. They've got one concern, and that is to ensure that Jack Hooper survives. Don't worry. Okay. Don't Can worry. you breathe all right, Andrew? Detectives are waiting to question a man in connection with the shooting death of a woman in Newport. A 45-year-old man is in hospital with what are thought to be self-inflicted gunshot wounds. After I'd given my statement, it was decided that um, I'd be taken back to Nan and Grandad's. It was a very fraught situation that I arrived back to. Nan and Grandad were hysterical. I was distraught. I couldn't believe that my daughter had been killed. It didn't seem real. I cried. He did. I did. All night long. And it was awful. And it never sank in. And I kept thinking, no, 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 she's not dead, she's coming back. And she didn't, did she? I just completely withdrew and shut off to survive. I stopped eating, stopped sleeping. It was really bad. Cheryl Hooper was killed outside her home in Newport at the end of January. Now, 10 months on, it's emerged that the suspect is waiting for a complicated 23-hour operation involving a team of specialist surgeons. That team is still in the process of being put together. This case on the outset looked like a fairly straightforward investigation, but it was an emotional roller coaster for 18 months full of unexpected twists and turns. Hooper, in my opinion, banged to rights. We got a witness that shows he killed Cheryl. But by the time I get to interview Hooper, it's 10 months down the line. The police interview with Jack Hooper was extraordinary. Something that I've never done and probably will never do again in my career. He suffered terrible injuries. He's unable to speak. He hasn't got a mouth. He hasn't got a nose. Is your name Andrew Jonathan Hooper? Yes. And also present is your solicitor. Are you responsible for the death of your wife, Cheryl Gabriel Hooper, on the 26th of January 2018? Can you be more accurate? Yes. Okay. At this stage, I'd like to introduce a prepared statement that Mr Hooper has given to me. I was knocking the driver's door window of the Range Rover with the barrel of the gun. 
just to emphasize that I was upset, and I suppose to scare her. And somehow the gun went off, and that's what broke the glass. I realized that both bombs had gone off, and I realized what I'd done, and I panicked and drove off. What do you mean when you say you wanted to scare her? I. End of word. W. A. N. T. E. D. End word. Wanted. T. O. End word. To. M. A. K. E. End of word. Make. H. E. R. End of word. Her. T. H. I. N. K. End of word. Think. End of sentence. I wanted to make her think. Hooper puts forward this rather bizarre account that he's only approached Cheryl with a loaded shotgun to scare her. Referring to the diagram, is that Cheryl's head? Yes. If you're holding the gun directly at the window, as you say, intending to break it, and you fire it, it's pointing directly at Cheryl. I don't understand why not, but the question was, if you're holding the gun directly at the window and, and, and you fire it to break the window, it, it, it's pointing directly at Cheryl and you're shaking your head indicating no, so... No, it's me. Okay. We needed to prove that Jack Hooper murdered Cheryl and that he didn't accidentally kill her and therefore get off with a lesser charge of manslaughter. Jack had made suicide attempts utilising his guns and we arranged to have those firearms revoked so he doesn't have access to any weapons. Unbeknownst to us and Cheryl, he's gone across to his parents' farm and sought out an antique firearm. It was at least 100 years old, in a terrible state of repair and possibly could have gone off at any time. So when you consider the argument that Hooper is advancing around accidental discharge, that gives me some concern. When we examine the firearm, we see that he's greased the weapon up. So he's obviously been preparing it to fire it. The first shot was from a matter of feet away. Now the second shot, Hooper stepped in to deliver that second fatal blow. That shows to me that he intended to kill Cheryl. The trial has begun of a farmer from near Newport who's accused of shooting dead his estranged wife. The prosecution alleges that 46-year-old Andrew Jonathan Hooper murdered Cheryl Hooper because he couldn't handle the fact that she'd left him. I was the first witness called in the trial. As daft as it sounds, it was a privilege to be able to stand there and do that for my mum. I faced him and I wasn't afraid, and he had to sit there and watch knowing he hadn't broken me. I remember forgetting his eyes in court. They were, they, they were just... Dead. Dead. No remorse at all. No Stared remorse. Stared at him. No. He stared back. I didn't take my eyes off him. A man has been found guilty of murdering his wife outside her home in Shropshire. Hooper has been sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 31 years. He didn't get away with killing Mum. That was justice. I grew up thinking that domestic abuse is punches and violence, physical violence. So with Jack, I didn't really feel for a long time that there was a distinct problem with his behaviour. I wouldn't have been able to say, this is wrong, this is domestic abuse. My mum wasn't fully aware of what was going on because when you're in it, you can't see it. His main aim was to make her feel completely worthless. It was power and control. 
Jack was incredibly abusive in many forms, financially, emotionally, mentally, to the point where he thought it was his right to kill her.